people are start. Yes. I don't know if on your side, James, if you can see the count, but it is going up rather quickly. No, I cannot see it. No. It's probably best not to know. <laughs> <laughs> I remember giving a talk in, at a conference in St. Louis where the panel outnumbered the audience. Oh. Mm. Well, that you're not, I won't tell you. That was, many, that. that was many years ago, many years ago. It wasn't Neil Armstrong related. Well, I will, I will keep it. I, I won't tell you till afterwards. So I think we're, James, I think we'll get started at... Right at seven. Yeah, seven o'clock. We'll, let's go for a minute or two past the hour. Just because I, I think, you know, if, if this was a live event, we might, we might wait for people to filter in. So, but I think being on Zoom, we can start pretty, pretty prompt. I think we're, we'll, we'll get started. <clears throat> Good evening, everyone, and welcome to this special Earth Day presentation for the Michael J. Colligan History Project. My name is Matthew Smith, and I'm the director of the Colligan Project here at Miami University's Hamilton campus. And I also want to say how excited I am to welcome this evening's presenter, James R. Hansen. This has been uh, a long time coming. We actually welcomed Dr. Hansen. I think it was in the spring of uh, 2020, we were looking forward to, to, to welcoming him. And of course, as we all know, events have intervened between now and then. So this is really the first time that we've been able to welcome back a presenter that was unfortunately postponed from last year. So this is a big, big event for us. And I want to thank uh, you all here today. I think we've got a great turnout. I'm looking forward to a great presentation and some great questions today. I also want to thank the Michael J. Colligan Committee of the Hamilton Community Foundation for supporting the, uh, the Colligan Project and supporting what we do here on the Hamilton campus. So before we get going, I will just say there will be a presentation today on First Man, the Life uh, of Neil A. Armstrong. And during the presentation, there will be an opportunity to think of questions to ask our presenter this evening. If you go down to the bottom of your, it should be on the bottom of your screen or depending on uh, your setup, you should be able to find uh, like a little, it's like a, almost a cartoon speech bubble, which, which says chat. Many of you will be familiar with Zoom from the past year. But if you click on that, you should see a little space to type in questions, greetings, comments, and so forth. So after today's presentation by Dr. Hansen, I will be moderating the Q&A and I will be presenting questions to, to tonight's speaker. So this evening's speaker, James R. Hansen, is a professor emeritus of history at Auburn University in the uh, state of Alabama, where he is joining us tonight via Zoom. A former historian for NASA, Dr. Hansen is the author of 12 books on the history of flight and aerospace, and is a two-time nominee for the Pulitzer Prize in history. His authorized biography, First Man, The Life of Neil A. Armstrong, was adapted into the wonderful movie, First Man, directed by Damien Chazelle, which won the 2019 Academy Award for Best Visual Effects. So I don't know what the competition for Best Visual Effects is this weekend, but it's my great pleasure uh, to introduce this evening's speaker, Dr. James R. Hansen. Well, thank you very much, Matthew. And uh, I'm very happy to be here, even if it's not in, uh, if it's, it's in just in a virtual sense. I've spent quite a bit of time over my life in uh, 
in the greater Cincinnati area, including Hamilton, of course, when I inter when I did the Armstrong book, the research was done mostly in the years 2002 to 2004, with the book originally coming out in 2005. Neil was living in a suburb of Cincinnati, and I did all of my interviewing with him there. I did 55 hours of tape recorded interview with him and spent a lot of other time with him in the area as well. So it's an, it's an area I'm, I'm pretty familiar with and, and I, I'm so happy to, to be here and I hope to be here with you. <laughs> and I hope someday that I'll be able to, to come and see your campus and be with you live. I never tire of speaking about Neil Armstrong. In fact, my family, when I was originally writing the book, you know, I, I couldn't, I was so infatuated with the topic and so obsessed with my research that my wife made it a rule that I could only talk about Neil Armstrong once per meal, but she made the mistake of not giving me a time limit. So <laughs> once I got started, I, I could go on for quite a while. But I, I would, it is important to say something about Earth Day. In, in several respects, it's, it's very appropriate to talk about Earth Day. Uh, of course, the original Earth Day dates back now 51 years to April of 1970. So we are having our 51st Earth Day. And I, I wanted to show you this because, you know, I, this is my 51st Earth Day too. I, I was a high school senior in April of 1970. So if you do the math, please don't do the math. It'll tell you how old I am. But these are some pictures. Actually, I grew up in Fort Wayne, Indiana, went to Elmhurst High School. And I was on, I co-chaired the committee. This was the very first Earth Day. I co-chaired the committee for our school's events. We had the day-long events. Everybody was let out. All the classes were let out. And they all went to different seminars and speeches and exhibits and things that we had. So these are just a couple of scenes from 51 years ago when I gave my very first talk on Earth Day. It's no accident that the first Earth Day in 1970 occurred just a few months following the first Apollo landing, Apollo 11's landing in July of 1969. Indeed, I think it's, it's, it's highly accurate to say that Earth Day's origins can be traced to humanity's exploration of the moon. This view of the Earth is that, that you're seeing here was generated by the Apollo 8 crew when they made their pioneering orbit of the moon in December 1968. So this was an orbital flight around the moon and back to Earth. The astronauts did not land. There was no landing vehicle on it, but they made a circumlunar flight and they took this picture of the Earth. And this was a, one of the stunning pictures that came back from that Apollo 8 mission. Several months later, the crew of Apollo 11, which did make the first landing on the lunar surface, captured both Earth rise, as it came to be known, and also the ascent stage of the lunar module Eagle, which you see here rising off the lunar surface to dock with the command module Columbia. And again, these images, stunning images captured by lunar explorers showed our planet hanging in space as a singular home for all humanity. And these had tremendous philosophical and psychological, emotional impacts on pe people all over the world at the time. Inspired by earlier, the earlier Apollo missions, the last Apollo landing mission, which was Apollo 17 in December of 1972, captured yet another iconic image of our home, the whole earth in one photograph. Over the years, NASA has often used this, icon, this view from Apollo 17 to describe Earth as, quote, an isolated ecosystem floating in space. So there's really no question, but lunar exploration really changed our view of Earth. We think about it just being moon oriented, but it changed our view of Earth. Here you see astronaut Dave Scott as command module pilot for Apollo 9. You see him beginning an EVA, an extravehicular activity, looking down from orbit in, in Earth orbit and looking down at Earth. And then later saying about this experience, and I quote him, it truly is an oasis and we don't take very good care of it. I think the elevation of that awareness is a real contribution to saving the earth. Now, I think Scott made that short, either in association to the first Earth Day or shortly thereafter. 
Then this photograph of the Earth's eastern hemisphere taken by a special high resolution spectrometer aboard a NASA satellite in 2012. You can see east coast of Africa, the Persian Gulf, you know, Saudi Arabia, India, Southeast Asia. You can see all of the eastern hemisphere. About his view of Earth from space, Apollo commanders, Apollo 7 commander Wally Shara said, and I quote, I left Earth three times. Wally made both Mercury flights, Gemini flights, and the Apollo flights. So he left Earth three times and he said, and I found no other place to go. Please take care of spaceship Earth was his message. And finally, here you see Earthrise, a fantastic image, as imaged by the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter, the LRO satellite, in the year 2015, so not that long ago. And this picture reminds me of a comment that Apollo 8 and Apollo 13 astronaut Jim Lovell made about America's lunar exploration. And I quote Lovell, we learned a lot about the moon but what we really learned about was the Earth. And finally, I'm, I'm showing you uh, a, qu a quote from Neil Armstrong, the subject of my talk um, tonight. This is what Neil said about the emergence of a new perspective about our Earth, developing hand in hand with our efforts to leave the planet and go elsewhere. This was when Neil flew the X-15 rocket plane uh, right out to the fringes of our atmosphere. And he made this comment to me in an interview about the impact of the X-15 and his flights right to the edge of space uh, about how thin the atmosphere was and how it's really a change of perspective that is, that is going to be the result of the space program. And that change of perspective really is an Earth Day is a, is a major factor in why Earth Day occurred and why it continues to occur. And of course, Neil's perspective about the home planet and about the moon was dramatically ex uh, enhanced by his own experience stepping down off of the lunar module Eagle onto the lunar surface at the Sea of Tranquility in July of 1969. And then having, and of course, this is not this is a not an, a real photograph, but it's a, a nice image of the boot print that Armstrong and later Aldrin would make in the lunar surface and what the view of Earth would have been from the point of view of an astronaut heading down onto the surface. So I thought on this Earth Day, it was really important to show the connections. I could give my entire talk on how our lunar exploration, what it has taught us about our home planet and, and about the origins and how they connect to the origins of Earth Day. But I'm here to talk about about Neil. And so I'm going to talk about Neil. I'm going to talk about him, both the myth and the reality, because, you know, this man, when he did step down from the lunar lander onto the surface, I mean, this was a moment for almost everyone frozen in time. I mean, the, the whole globe was watching this happen uh, on television on July 20th or July 21st, if you were in Europe or in Asia at the time difference. Everybody was watching this. And of course, the famous quote of one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. This, I mean, Neil immediately became an icon, became a, almost a demigod, you know, in a lot of people's views. And, and so whatever people thought about him from that point on. I mean, you ha had a real problem in a sense, Neil certainly did, of, of differentiating the myth that was projected onto him, I mean, who they thought Neil was and who he really, really was. Of course, this is my favorite photograph of Neil because I'm in it as a, and it's even more favorite now because it shows me when I had a bit more hair. But this was outside of Neil's home, uh, I think in about 2004, 2003, after we had conducted one of our interviews. And so I was very privileged to get to know Neil in a personal way. It was important for me as a biographer to keep some object objectivity. My goal was not to become his friend. It was to write an objective biography and show him as a three-dimensional person. It wasn't, to, you know, to just be, wasn't what one would call hagiography, hey, which is, you know, writing about the saints. I mean, that isn't what I was trying to do. I was trying to get to the real Neil, but to get to the real Neil was kind of like peeling, you know, an onion. You have to take off layers after layers and try to get to the real person. And I learned pretty quickly that you needed to demythologize Armstrong if you were going to really get to the 
to the real man. And one of the things that I believe strongly as a biographer is here you see a series of Neil as a boy. I thought, and I, I believe even more strongly, I'm still doing some biographical work. And you don't really understand the adult personality unless you understand childhood and family background and the impact of the communities in which he lived with the famous Will Wordsworth quote, the child is the father to the man. So I spent a good deal of time trying to find out, you know, how he grew up and the impact of his parents and his friends and his siblings. And so I paid a lot of attention to that and there was a lot to learn from it. I'm gonna start with a story because this, this will get me into the meat of my talk. You're looking at a slide that shows a home in Wapakoneta, Ohio. Of course, Neil's father was an auditor for the state of Ohio, and he and he, he basically went around for the state to different counties, almost all of them rural counties, as most Ohio counties are, and basically did the books uh, for the for the county. And when it took about a year to do, you know, a county's books and do the audit, and then Neil's dad was moved to another county across state sometimes. Well, they ended up in Wapakoneta by the time Neil was, I think, an eighth grader. And he spent, you know, he'd lived in Upper Sandusky, he'd lived in St. Mary's, they had lived up near Cleveland and over in the eastern part of the state. But they, Wapakoneta claims him as, as, as their own and, and he did do his high school years in Wapakoneta. Here's my story though. Neil in 1969 was, before the mission took place, of course, there was the news that he was on the mission and that he was not only on the mission, he was going to be the commander of Apollo 11. And that was an especially big deal for people in the state of Ohio and the people of Wapakoneta. I mean, good homeboy makes good. And so, and of course, and the newspapers from all around the country, really all around the world were interested in learning as much as they could about the man who was gonna be the first to walk on the moon. So lots of reporters, journalists came to Wapakoneta looking to write feature stories and find out about him. Well, one of the men that, that got interviewed a lot in the months leading up to the moon landing was a man named Jacob Zint, who lived in this house a few blocks away from the Armstrong house in Wapakoneta. And Jacob Zint was an engineer. He worked for Westinghouse up the road in Lima, Ohio. And I, I love to be talking to Ohio people because they know places <laughs> I'm talking about. And he was he was a bachelor He and he was kind of Mr. Wizard. Now, Young people aren't going to remember Mr. Wizard, your parents or grandparents might, who had a television show. And Mr. Wizard was kind of an inventor and he could fix everything. And, and so he, Jacob Zint was really kind of Mr. Wizard. And one of the things that Mr. Zint, the engineer, did was at the top of his home, you can see the arrow, he built an astronomical observatory in which he put a homemade telescope that he built himself. And Zint told the newspaper reporters the, st the story about how Neil, as a young boy, as a Boy Scout, and Neil was indeed, you can see him over there in his Boy Scout uniform, he became an Eagle Scout, how Mr. Zint invited the Boy Scout troop to come to his home. He took them up to the observatory. He told them how he built the telescope. And then he let each boy in turn come and look through the telescope. At the end of the evening, there was this one blonde boy that was kind of hanging around and shyly came up to Mr. Zint and asked him if he could come back. You know, he'd like to, to talk more with him. He'd like to go th look through the telescope again. And according to Mr. Zint, and these are Mr. Zint's quotes and story were put in all, in, all these different papers, uh, not just the Wapakoneta Daily News and the Toledo Blade, but all across the country and even internationally. And, and Mr. Zint was quoted as saying that Neil came back many, many times in the coming years. And they would talk about the moon and the galaxy and the sun and everything about space. And Neil would look through the telescope, they'd have long conversations. And then on the eve of Apollo 11, according to Mr. Zent, he's quoted as saying that Neil has gotten a message to me through a, a mutual friend that when he gets out on the lunar surface, he's going to explore some of the theories that he and Mr. Zent had talked about the lunar surface years before. Well, that was a terrific story. And I thought if for someone who's interested in young Neil Armstrong and I mean how this this these stories made perfect sense. I mean, 
you wouldn't you expect someone who's going to be the first man on the moon to have had this sort of interest and this sort of inspiration and to have and mr zent was very very proud to tell the story about the role that he had and mr zent became sort of a local hero because he had he had been the person who motivated and inspired and educated neil armstrong about space when, so when, when after the mission took place in July 1969, this town of Wapakoneta had a big parade for Neil and his family, you know, to celebrate the moon landing. And it was a huge parade. The state of, the, the governor of Ohio was there. The Purdue Band and the Golden Girls. Neil was a Purdue graduate. The, the Ohio governor, Jim Rhodes, was there. Big deal. Neil and his family was in an open convertible parading down Main Street. And so, too, was Jacob Zint. Jacob Zint had his own convertible automobile that they put him in. And he got, you know, you know he got handshakes and clapping and, and way to go, Jake, because of what he had done. So I wanted to interview Neil. When I did interview him, I wanted to hear more about Jacob Zint. So I asked Neil, I said, tell me more about Jacob, your relationship with Jacob Zent, because it seems so formative for you in your development and the interest in space. Well, Neil, you know, always a pretty shy guy in a lot of ways. And Neil, you know, looked down at the ground, looked back up, looked back at the ground again, looked up at me and he said, Jim, it's not true. I said, true, what's not true? I, he said, well, Mr. Zint's story is mostly just made up. We did go to his house. He did show us the telescope, how he built it. He wouldn't let any of us touch the telescope or look through the telescope. And when we left that night from his house, I never saw him again. I never, I mean, I might've seen him in the yard, but we, we never interacted again. Well, I was flabbergasted because I had all these newspaper clippings, you know, Mr. Zint, the picture of him in the, in the, in the convertible and all these stories and all these quotes. And I couldn't believe, I said, Neil, I said, why, why, if this was just made up, if he was just trying to barge in and be part of your story, why didn't you correct that at some point? And he just sort of, again, looked down, looked back at me, and I swear to God, what he said to me was, I just didn't want to rain on his parade. Neil was like that. Neil just felt like, you know, it wasn't doing anybody any harm. He didn't, by that point, it would have been really a, an embarrassment for Mr. Zint. I can tell you when my book came out, and it does include this, all of this about Mr. Zint, that I had some experiences with members of the Zint family. He didn't have any children of his own, but he had nieces and nephews. So I. I could talk to you about that, but this was, I tell you this story, not because it's just a, a very interesting anecdote, but because it told me early on in my research that I wasn't going to be able to trust anything that people told me about Neil, because people, you know, Mr. Zent was not the only one. I mean, it might be the worst example of making stuff up, but there were Lots of people that had stories about Neil that just turned out to be true. Neil became such a big figure, and he was such a vessel to carry what other people wanted to put into that vessel, because Neil didn't fill up his own space very much. I mean, he was who he was, but he didn't try to tell you who he was. He didn't try to elaborate on who he was. And so since he didn't really tell anybody, people could say things about him and fill up his vessel, and it and it could hold, it, it could take. And so I just figured that this now, I needed to really be careful in my research. But from the point of view of myth, this became very important to me because here you see four of the children's books that were, had been written by about Neil Armstrong by the time I published First Man. Now there are several others since then, but all four of these tell the Jacob Zint story as if it's true as if here the young boy Armstrong was highly influenced and inspired by these conversations and this experience with Mr. Zint's telescope. So if these, I mean, this to me was not just you know, a trivial matter, this was significant because it was laying out a trajectory 
for Armstrong's life experiences and who he was that just was not authentic. So I developed this slide to sort of show you this is the trajectory that one would have if one accepted Zint's story, which most everybody did prior to my research. And that was that Neil was a dreamer. He was into astronomy. He was into the heavens and telescopes, the moon, the stars, read a lot of science fiction. And then his trajectory was, well, of course, it makes sense that this is the sort of person who would end up, end up being an astronaut and, and doing a moon landing. It was a very logical trajectory. And you could tell a life story that way. Problem was, it was totally bogus. It was false. So I needed to find out what the real trajectory was. And so that's what I worked on hard in my early research for the book. And it turns out that Neil, as a young boy, even as a, I mean, he was a very avid model builder, built model by plane, saved all his pennies and nickels, begged his mother, you know, whenever at the hardware store or dime store to help him, you know, buy aviation magazines or buy materials so he could build airplanes. He, but he became, he, he wasn't a typical um, boy working with model airplanes. And I'll tell you just one story. Here you can see in the bottom right, him with his sister, June, and his brother, Dean, younger brother, Dean. Neil was the oldest of three. And this is the house in Wapakoneta where they lived. Neil would build, he did build so many model airplanes. Some were done better than others. Some he didn't think he had done very good jobs with. And so with some airplanes, he would actually take them upstairs, the upstairs bedroom window, and he'd teach his br little brother and his little sister how he wanted them to toss the airplane out of the window. And then Neil would, after he had a whole box full of the, of the planes, then he would have them tossed out the window. He would have you know, popsicle sticks and, and a little notebook. And as the airplanes came out, they would land on the ground and Neil would mark where the, where the uh, flight had ended. And then he would write it all down in the little notebook and he'd pick them all up, take them back upstairs, have them sent out again. Well, this was, this was experimental test flight. Neil would later become a test pilot and his method of research was not much more systematic than, he, than it was when he was a little boy. He was a proto-engineer, even as a boy. And so it's an, it, that is so much more important to know about him than the false story of, of Jacob Zint that he was a dreamer looking through telescopes. He was an engineer looking at how wings best functioned and how they best flew. He had a pilot's license before he had his driver's license. He wasn't so interested in automobiles. In fact, there are crazy stories that people tell about him that I think are did, did turn out to be pretty true because they were they were several several stories that in terms of driving an automobile, he was a little bit scary as an automobile driver. He had a few accidents. He on his prom night from Wapakoneta and with a double date in the back seat, he actually in the middle of the night they drove off. The, the road into a ditch. And then once when he was a test pilot at Edwards Air Force Base in California, he ran a Jeep with an MP off the road. So there are all these stories about him in automobiles. But the point is, he was much more about airplanes. And he, and he wanted that pilot's license and he got it on his exactly on his 16th birthday. There was a little grass airfield on the outskirts of Wapakoneta with a couple of, of veteran Army Air Corps pilots that did lessons. And Neil would go out there, ride his bicycle. He would earn a little pocket money and, and, and some flying time by doing odd jobs around the hangar. And that's where he learned how to fly this Aronka Champ airplane. He went to Purdue University in fall of 47 on a Navy scholarship, and his goal was to become an aircraft designer. You know, he had skipped the second grade, I think it was, and so he graduated. He was pretty, he was always young compared to his colleagues, but so he arrives at Purdue. He actually flew, he rented an Aronka and flew over to West Lafayette, where Purdue is located, and actually for his freshman orientation. So I can always just imagine him landing at the Purdue airport. The mechanics come out and they see this kid that looks like he's 14 when he's 17. He always looked younger than he was. And, you know, it wouldn't have been done this way, but like my imagination is tossing them the keys and them saying, fill it up and change the oil and I'll be back tomorrow morning or something. But Neil was about airplanes and he was going to Purdue to become an aircraft designer. His scholarship with the Navy had him, after two years of schooling, 
the Korean War broke out, 1950. And so he was called to start his naval aviation training in Pensacola, Florida. And this is a picture of him. This is my all-time favorite picture of Neil. Again, how old does he look in that picture? He's 19, but he looks 14. This was after his first aircraft carrier landing. And that's one of the major distinguishing features of a naval pilot, and that is that they have to learn how to take off and land on an aircraft carrier. And that's a completely special type of flying. And Neil was doing that by the time he was 19. Then of course he went, to, he went to Korea and he in fact was chosen by one of the naval commanders, air commanders to be part of one of the Navy's few all jet airplane units. Of course, the jet airplane was quite new in the years right after World War II. So Neil flies the F-9F Panther jet. It's the Navy's first all-jet squadron. And so he gets a lot of flying experience. He's, by, he's the youngest man in the unit. He's sort of the mascot for all of the other more experienced pilots. And he has a lot of experience. He has a combat experience in the Panther where he, he, he has to bail out at one point and it could have, it could have been a very serious uh, injury that could have cost his life. But he, had, he flew like 78 different combat missions in the Korean War. When that service was over, then he goes back to Purdue. He gets his degree in aeronautical engineering. And when he comes out in 1955 with his degree, he has decided that he doesn't want to design airplanes per se, but he wants to keep flying, but he wants to combine his flying with his engineering. So the best way to do that was to become a research pilot. So he gets, he gets hired by the federal government. Before NASA, there was an organization known as NACA, National Advisory Committee for Aeronautics. And it evolves into NASA in the months after the Sputnik uh, crisis, the Soviet Sputnik, which gave birth to the space age. The federal government decided it needed to step up its, its organization for space flight work. So NACA becomes NASA and, and Neil shifts over to NASA. So he's a research pilot with NASA for seven years and he flies 50 different types of aircraft, 2,400 2, hours of flying time, just uh, every possible cutting edge aircraft you can do from helicopters to, to lifting bodies to jets, to rockets. In fact, he's the only one, he'll become a member of the second class of NASA astronauts in 1962. And he's the only one in the first two classes of astronauts for NASA who had done any flying at all in a rocket powered aircraft. And so when I showed you earlier about Neil's, how he thought flying to the edge of space would change perspective, human perspective, he made seven flights in that X-15. The highest altitude was over 207,000 feet. So he got right up there. And if you've seen the movie First Man or will see it, the first scene is a flight of the X-15 up to the very edge of space when he sees that thin atmosphere above him. So all of that, I mean, it's a quick quick and dirty biography that, I'm, that I gave you. There's so much more that could be said. But you remember the previous slide showing the trajectory as it would be if you saw, if you believed uh, and did believe uh, the Jacob Zint story. This is the realistic trajectory that Neil moves from a boy that's building model airplanes as a proto-engineer that goes to Purdue, an engineering school to learn how to be an aircraft designer, becomes a fighter pilot in Korea, then a test pilot, one that flies the aircraft. His own life, this little bar over to the right shows subsonic to transonic to supersonic to hypersonic. Neil is, is, circula is situated in time I mean, our, all of our lives are situated in time and, and sort of the parameters or the context for what we're able to do connects to what's going on in, our, in the world around us. And it just so happened, Neil's own choices, his own passions, his own, what he wants to do with his life come at a time when the technology of flight is moving from a subsonic to a transonic, to a supersonic, to a hypersonic speed regime and moving from propellers to jets, to rockets. And so he's perfectly situated, born in 1930, a 15-year-old at the end of World War II, uh, a 20-year-old at the time of Korea, a 28-year-old at the time the space age comes to life. He is perfectly situated in time for this trajectory to really seriously take off. 
Now this connects to my the theme that I'm I'm bringing up, but it's a quote from Neil to me. You know, after listening to him and and knowing his life story as I came to know it, I asked him the question: Do you even consider yourself an explorer? Because I was thinking, you know, he's really not describing a, a classical definition of someone who's an explorer. And what he did, and this quote. What I attended to was the progressive development of flight machinery. My exploration came totally as a byproduct of that. I flew to the moon, not so much to go there, but as part of developing the system that would allow it to happen. And I think that is a crucial quote to understand. If you understand what he means by that, you understand so much about him, so much more than you would ever understand if you were just putting it into the framework of what Jacob Zint tried to make us believe about him. So biography for me, certainly when you're dealing with someone like Neil Armstrong, who becomes so iconic, who is the type of personality that a lot you could project things into him, and he didn't deny it. He didn't fill up his own space, you know, telling everybody who he really was and who he really wasn't. There are so many myths about Neil. I mean, I'm only going to, I think I'll, I'll cover one more just to show you that it's not just the one. But again, if you really want to get to the real Neil Armstrong, you've got to cut your way through these myths. But at the same time, the myths are so darn interesting because they tell us not so much about Neil, they tell us about us. We're the ones that built the myths. We're the ones that felt that we needed Armstrong to be this sort of person or these sorts of person. And so I, my book, I've often said that my book was not just a biography, it was an iconography, because I really had to explore the icon, the iconic aspects of Neil to understand, you know, really what the Armstrong persona became. Myth number two, and I think, you know, for I want to make sure I get to questions. So I only, I, I have about 10 or 12 that I could go through with you. But myth number two is an important one as well. And I think it does, the, the Jacob Zint myth does load or feed itself into this one as well. Although Zint himself, I don't think he's so much guilty of it, but but it can grow out of it. And that is the idea that Neil was preordained in some way to be the commander of the first lunar landing. And I have to tell you, that's a myth. And I want to explain it very simply. It, I could do a whole 50 minute lecture and have on what really Go, explains that myth. But the truth is it could have been any one of the Apollo commanders. Deke Slayton, who was the head of the astronaut corps, who put the crews together and picked the commanders, believed that he had a sufficient number of commanders who were really highly qualified and very good commanders that if any one of them were given a specific mission to do, they would train to do it and they would be able to do it very effectively. In other words, any one of these guys, Frank Borman down to Jim Lovell, I mean, Deke Slayton would have been perfectly happy being one of the commanders. He had to put the crews together because there were all these different missions to accomplish. And it just so happened that, you know, certain things happened and I don't have the time to go through all of them, but there was a fire you know, that killed three Apollo astronauts, including Gus Grissom, who could very, would very well have been on this list of commanders. Deke Slayton was a Mercury astronaut along with Gus Grissom. And there were in his autobiography, in Slayton's autobiography, he actually said if Gus had lived, he would have really liked to have seen Gus as the first man on the moon and the commander of that mission. So the fact that that crew died, and then also when the Apollo 8, which I showed you the picture of the lunar, you know, of the flight around the moon and the pictures uh, of the Earth rise. Well, that Apollo 8 was meant to be a flight, you know, of the lunar practicing with the lunar lander in Earth orbit. But that lunar lander, which was built by Grumman on Long Island, wasn't ready to be flown. And so they came and asked, said, well, what are we going to do? We got to beat the Russians and we've got to keep things moving. So they decided to turn Apollo 8 into this circumlunar flight, which was a very audacious idea. So Borman became the commander of that Apollo 8 flight. So there were lots of different things, men's health. I mean, there were surgeries and things that happened with a couple of them that changed the crews. So when, in order for Apollo 11 to be the landing, there had to be Apollo 8 had to go off right, Apollo 9 had to fulfill a mission, Apollo 10 had to fulfill a mission. And if, they had, if anything had gone wrong with those, things could have slipped 
the schedule could have slipped and Apollo 11 could have done something else. It could have been Apollo 12 that landed that would have made the first landing. It could have been any of these guys within reason. It, it could have been. They would all they all would have been acceptable. There was nothing preordained about Neil being selected as the commander to do that landing mission. And Neil knew this. Neil knew this and some of the, mis the misjudgments or uh, wrongheadedness about Neil's personality came from the fact that he seemed to be so shy and modest and unwilling to take credit for something that he should have taken credit for more than he did. And when the book came out, there was an interview on 60 Minutes and Ed Bradley, the man you see with Neil in the lower right, asked Neil about, you know, being so modest and not taking credit for, you know, him being the first on the moon and being the commander of that mission. And Neil said, to Ed Bradley, I wasn't chosen to be first. I was chosen to command that flight. Circumstance put me in that particular role. I just don't deserve it. Now, that is a little much in terms of modesty. But if you understand what I'm saying about he wasn't preordained and it was really a matter of contingency and circumstance, changing circumstances that put him in that role, then you can understand what he's saying. Now, if you don't have the time to listen to all those different things, people would say, what's he talking about? You know, he's just, you know, he's just overly modest, but he's exactly right. And this is the type of man that he was, you know, he was a straight shooter and he was an engineer. He wanted everything, you know, factually correct. Well, as I said, there's all kinds of myths that I could go on with. There's the myth about first out and why Neil went out before Buzz did. You know, if somebody wants to ask me about that, I'll be glad to, to answer it. There's the myth about Neil later in life becoming a recluse, that he, you know, kind of a hermit. He didn't go out. He didn't, you know, which was not true. I mean, I know myself personally, and I know from, re from researching his entire life story, Neil did a lot of stuff. I mean, he gave a lot of talks. He went to a lot of events. He did a lot of things. Of course, he couldn't do everything he was asked to do. He was asked to do, you know, just unbelievable types of things, not just an unbelievable number, but crazy things too that he just didn't didn't entertain. But I think the, the myth of him b being a recluse might have been built from the media, from the newspaper men and women who want, who approached Neil or tried to approach Neil to get him to uh, do interviews that wanted to write feature stories on Neil. And Neil was not in the least interested in doing an interview for a feature story in a newspaper or a magazine. He, he, he was somewhat accustomed to that back when he was an astronaut. Life magazine had a special contract to do the personal stories and the family stories related to the astronauts. And Neil was never too happy with how those turned out. So he only, the only stories he would agree to or any comments he would make to media over the years, just right up to the very end, was if there was something that happened in aerospace technology, his expertise, that he thought he had something that was productive and constructive and helpful to say. But if, but just to go back and talk about the moon or his life or whatever, he wasn't interested in doing that. So I think the media, when they get rejected, they just basically, I think, invented the myth, well, the man's a recluse. He doesn't talk to anybody. Well, he just doesn't talk to you. He doesn't talk to, you know, to, to those, to that group. But there were lots and lots of others that he talked to. So I'm going to stop there and we'll just go to Q&A. I appreciate your patience with me. And like I said, there are so many different myths about him, about his religious beliefs. That's another aspect that can be discussed. There's, there's so much about him. And I guess I'll just conclude by saying, you know, I put in the, the, the front page of my book where you can put an epigram to sort of introduce the book. I have a quote from one of my favorite authors. And the quote is, the privilege of a lifetime is being who you are. And I think it fit Neil so well because Neil always did his absolute best to tr stay true to who he was. There were so many forces at work pushing and pulling and tugging at him to get him to do things that were not consistent with his personality, not consistent with his values. He did his best in a polite way most of the time to not ever move himself in directions that he knew were not compatible with who he, who he really was. I'm proud to have really 
you know, gotten through, I think I portray Neil. Some people might want a deeper psychological portrayal of Neil than I was able to provide. I, you know, I've talked to, you know, I, for the book and after I've talked to members of the family, his sons, his brother and sister, others, his wives, you know, his, his first wife, Janet, his second wife, Carol. And, uh, you know, trying to get any more deeply into his psychology is something that anybody that ever was associated with Neil would like, would like to try to do, but it's uh, not an easy, not, not an easy one. He's a tough nut to crack. And I think the book in its totality gets you as close to understanding Neil. I will say that I've done two books in recent years published by Purdue University Press, his alma mater, which are letters sent to Neil and Neil's replies to some of those letters. I think there are aspects, those letters, that correspondence of his that I, from which I drew this material was not available to me when I wrote First Man. So I think there are certain insights about Neil that come through these letters. One book, the first volume is called Dear Neil Armstrong, and the second volume is called The Reluctant Icon. If you, if you get those letters and you match them up with the biography, you, you have as full a picture of the man I think you're ever going to get. Thank you very much, and I hope I can answer some questions for you. Well, thank you once again, Dr. Hansen. This has been wonderful. We have some time for questions. I think one of the, if I can say, one of the great things about talking to an audience in Southwest Ohio, even though we're on the internet, is that we have people in the audience who actually have a, an actual connection with, with Armstrong. Not surprised. I'm sure you will be interested to, to hear some of those connections. So I actually want to start off with David Butler, and I'm just going to be reading his comment and question. Neil Armstrong was in our aerospace engineering and engineering mechanics department at the University of Cincinnati, just down the road. My colleague had an office next door to Neil's office. His phone rang off the hook. Neil's <laughs> phone rang off the hook so much that he eventually decided he couldn't continue on our faculty. Just too much publicity. Did he talk about this constant attention? I think you've touched on that, but maybe does that... Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, I, I certainly did talk to him about it. But at the same time, I almost felt like talking to him about these incidents and they were, they were voluminous was almost like bringing up bad memories for him, you know. So a lot of the stories actually came from the people around him. Like, I mean, I did talk to some of the other professors who taught with him in that department. And I also talked, I had a whole evening's of talk with about a dozen of his former students. I had them telling me stories. I mean, the very first day of class in Cincinnati, the media came out in the hallway and was waiting for the class and for Neil to come out of the classroom. And Neil you know, let them out like one at a time. He'd shove one out and shut the door one out. And, and, and so the students really got, you know, they, they had a great time telling me these stories. It was almost like I didn't want to bother him with stories because it was like, it was almost like I was intruding on him once again, you know, and making him remember things that he didn't really care to remember. I do remember another story from the University of Cincinnati. He had a visitor come to his classroom one day and of course the younger people in the class and it was mostly men I think one or two women because you know it's engineering after all and there weren't a lot of women back then still not as many as we should have but the actress Gina Lola Brigida the Italian you know mm. sex pot had a, who Neil had met on the around the world tour in Rome Italy Gina came to Cincinnati and showed up <laughs> to see him in his classroom. And I think Neil had to like introduce her to the class or something. So, I mean, yeah, I, I, those are all stories that I wanted to hear. And, you know, I interviewed, besides having 55 hours with Neil, I had 125 or 30 other people that I interviewed, you know, did the interviews with. And no doubt I missed another 125 that would have had great stories. But yeah, at the time, I mean, to have Neil Armstrong as your professor or your colleague, you know, you were going to witness, you know, a lot of harassment and bother that the man had to put up with in his career. Wow. And we, we're getting a, a great deal of questions coming in. So I'm going to try and get to as many as we can. I'll try to, I'll try to give my answer shorter. Uh, so the next <laughs> one you can answer, I hope, yes or no. Did you have Skyline Chili with Neil Armstrong? No, we had Grater's Peppermint Chocolate Chip Ice Cream. That was his favorite ice cream. We never got the chili, but after graders, I mean, who would want, you know, we, I, what was really cool was I mean, this was in Indian Hill or near Indian Hill where the graders was. And I remember waiting in line with him and I'm seeing other people in there and thinking, 
I'm in line with Neil Armstrong to get an ice cream cone. And these people don't have a clue <laughs> because by the time Neil started to look like this as an older man, you know, and he'd been out of the public eye for the most part, you know, you, he could go places and, and not, you know, and routinely not be recognized. But yeah, no Skyline Chili, but lots of Grater's ice cream. Grater's is, yeah, I definitely respect anyone whose favorite flavor is peppermint. Uh, it's ras raspberry, <laughs> raspberry chocolate. Raspberry chocolate. chocolate. So very quick question. Actually, I'm going to combine two questions here. One of which is when you think about U.S. history, who would you compare or contrast with Armstrong? And then the second one related to that is actually an anonymous question. How is Neil most similar to the other Apollo commanders and how is he most different from them? So comparing yeah, those to are, other folks in, in American those history. Those are both, both really interesting questions. I'll do the second one first. Similar in the sense, I mean, this is really kind of astonishing. I didn't know this until like, I mean, it was staring me at the in the face, but six of the seven commanders chosen to do lunar landing missions were naval aviators. The Air Force guys didn't like hearing that. They still probably don't. But Dave Scott was the only Air Force guy. The rest of them were Navy commanders. And what does naval aviators have that's, that's singularly distinctive? They learned how to fly off on and off carriers. I've had several conversations with both Navy people and Air Force people as to, is it something in the training and education or is it something in the nature of the flying? But Deke Slayton, who put the crews together and picked the commanders, was an Air Force guy himself. So there was no reason, there was no Navy bias in him, but six of those seven commanders turned out to be naval aviators. So I think that was a commonality that, that is really worth thinking about. In terms of difference, I think, you know, test pilots and engineers, you know, are not just one type. I mean, there's a spectrum that, that they have. And on that spectrum, Neil's way over on the cerebral side, way over on the introspective cerebral side. Not that he couldn't have a good time, not that he couldn't tell a corny joke. You know, I never heard him tell a, a dirty joke. I've heard him tell, tell a lot of corny jokes. And, you know, he could drink a beer or a glass of wine or scotch and be very sociable with the guys. But still, he was more quiet in the sense that he didn't always tell you what he was thinking you know Aldrin would tell you what he was thinking um, ad nauseum Armstrong you know they, even his fellow crew members and his flight directors couldn't always be sure that they knew what he was thinking they weren't sure that he was gonna you know when they went over mission rules before the the flight you know Neil seemed to be okay with everything but he wasn't real verbose about his agreement with it so they when they sent him off to the launch pad they could never really be sure what he was thinking because he didn't tell them they had faith in him and they they should have but i think that's a difference uh, the two differences that i would say in terms of just shortly briefly what i would say in terms of historic personality to me the comparison is natural between him and charles Lindbergh. And for me, it's really going to be interesting to look further and further into this. I mean, I've already looked at it some, but the Lindbergh Foundation has asked me to write a new Lindbergh book for the 2027 100th anniversary of Charles's solo transatlantic flight. So I'm reading, I'm deeply immersed right now in reading all of Lindbergh's books, all of his wife, uh, Anne Morrow Lindbergh's diaries and books. And so there's a lot of interesting comparisons and I think some really significant differences between the two of them. And I hope to lay those, lay those out more as I learn more about Lindbergh. And I just want to say right now, if we're all still around in 2027, uh, <laughs> yeah, I, me too. I, I will be happy to invite you back to talk about yeah, Lindbergh. I hope I, I can live long enough to just be a great book. sequel. So I'm going to combine a couple more questions here. There are a lot of questions about the famous quote. That's one small step for a man, one giant leap for mankind. I want to ask, just on behalf of uh, the folks here, did Neil Armstrong know what he was going to say once he stepped on the moon? And what exactly did he mean by the famous phrase, giant leap for mankind? Yeah, well, Neil was very consistent in how he answered. I mean, he, he was asked that a number of times. And Neil always said, you know, people were offering him different ideas and he never you know, he was, he would politely kind of ignore them, you know, prior, to, he would basically say, well, when the, when the time comes, I'll hopefully have something appropriate to say. What he told me and then what he's told other people, a few other people, at least, is that, you know, 
most importantly, he had to land the, the, the spacecraft. That was his job to land it. And there was no guarantee it was going to land. I mean, it could, the, the flight could have been aborted, you know, and they would have gone back up. So why think about what you're going to say when you step out, when you might not even get that chance. So what Neil said was he, I think he had a, just a kernel of the, of the basic idea, but then when they landed, they had some time, you know, before they suited up and, and went out. And Neil said during that time is when he really kind of composed the statement. And so he did have it pre-composed, but not until after the landing. Then he stepped out. And of course, Neil believed, he said, and to his dying day believes, he said, one small step for a man. A man. And the A, nobody could hear that. And there's been, there's a mystery about that. There have been linguists and, you know, uh, you know electronics experts who've gone over that recording and the best, the best recording of it. And it doesn't seem like there's enough space in there for him to have said the A. I address this at length in the book. And what I asked Neil, well, how do we handle it? And he said, well, put the A in parentheses. You know, that would be a typical, you know, kind of humor that Neil the engineer had, you know. In terms of what it meant, I just think, you know, it's, to him, it was kind of like a, was, he thought it was a sophomoric kind of thing. He didn't realize or understand why people made such a big deal about it. Well, it's natural, a man's taking a step out onto the moon, lunar surface, but the significance of it is obviously much more than just the one man. It's it's something for mankind. It's going to the moon. It's, it's exploring the universe. And so it was just a beautiful, simple connection that he made. And I mean, I think the fact that we're, we still even have this controversy on whether the A was in there or not, I mean, it just makes it all, just adds a mystique to it that I think is, I'm fine with it just being what it is. Very good. You mentioned questions about Armstrong's religious views. Jenneth was asking after spending time in the heavens, what were his religious views? Yeah, well, first of all, Neil always kept his religious beliefs to himself. He, he did not want to talk to them about them really with anybody. His family background, his mother was a strong evangelical Christian and raised her children to be that. There's good, good reason to, to uh, believe that Neil, it didn't really quite take with Neil. He wouldn't argue with his mother. His, his sister and brother would tell me that Neil would listen politely always and never say anything and turn away. And so the mother believed that Neil was a good, was, a, was following in her footsteps and was a good Christian man. And he was a good man, no question about it. But Neil's religion is what we would call deism or deistic. He believed in a God that was the maker of the universe and set the, everything in motion. But he didn't really believe in a personal God or a personal savior. It was really more like the God of Isaac Newton, the, that, that is the master engineer, the master craftsman of the universe. Neil worshipped or prayed in that kind of fashion. And I know for a fact that deism is what he called himself because I saw a couple of applications, you know, one to be a leader of a Boy Scout troop out in California when he was still a test pilot. It was actually through a church. And he, in filling out the application, he had to put religious affiliation. And on the form, he wrote deist. And the minister wasn't even sure what that meant. And he called a fellow test pilot who was a member of that congregation, said, I got this application from this Armstrong guy, and he says he's a deist. And I don't know what that is. Do you know what that is? And the fellow test pilot said, oh, I don't know what it is either, but I can tell you Armstrong's a great man, and there's nothing to worry about with him. So he, there were stories about him that said he was an atheist when he was an astronaut. That's not true. It's a, it's a over, gross oversimplification. There's a big difference between a, being a deist and being an atheist, but he wasn't a conventional Christian believer for sure. I have another question here. We're at eight o'clock, but I think because we have so many questions, I think we can go for a, a few more minutes. So I have a question here from Holly who wants to know if there's any truth to him, the story that he dropped his daughter's bracelet on the moon to honor her memory. Mm. Yeah, that's a, a very uh, question that I get a lot these days because in the movie, they show him doing it. Here's what I can tell you, is that the, the manifest that NASA had the astronauts fill out to tell, to keep a record of what was brought, what they brought in terms of personal items with them to the lunar surface. They had what was called a PPK, a personal property kit. And it was a little bag and they could put, and they did put coins and jewelry and stuff for other people. And 
We have never seen Neil's manifest. No one, no one has. In fact, there's a box at Purdue where Neil's papers are at that is that is taped up and secured and nobody, I mean, Neil asked for it not to be seen for a number of years. Maybe the manifest is in there. The truth, what we do know is that we don't know what he took to the moon. He didn't tell people what he took to the moon, although there were a few items that he did identify, but the totality of what he took, we do not know for sure. He did go over to the little, to the crater on an unscheduled visit to the crater. He was out of sight of the television and there were, and, and we don't know exactly what he did there. They had, NASA had to call him in quickly saying, we're, you know, we need you back. You need to get yourself back here and to hustle there and to back Neil's heart rate shot up to over 180 or something. They got very concerned about him. In fact, there's, there's, I mean, among the crazy things that are still being written about him, there's a guy that, that a medical doctor who thinks that Neil had some kind of a heart, some minor heart attack when he was on the lunar surface. So that's still out there, you know, to be discussed too. But so the fact is, we don't know, we don't know that he did do it, but Truthfully, we don't know that he didn't do it in terms of the bracelet. What I told the movie makers, you know, I, you know, who, who are they going to listen to? I'm just the author of the book. I said, why don't you do it where it isn't so, you don't, you don't make it so literal. You make it almost like a dream sequence. And, and, and so really people watching the movie are not sure whether he actually did do it or he thought about doing it or whatever to make it kind of, you know, that kind of an experience. But they chose not to do it that way. So, you know, I'm okay with the way they did it because we don't know for sure. I mean, if I were to go to the Sea of Tranquility, the first thing I would do is get down in the crater and see if I can find something. I mean, I think at some point somebody will do that. But I wish they wouldn't because whatever is there or not there, I think we're better off leaving it, you know, the way he left it. You know, so many of these questions are touching on the same themes. Yeah. So I, I, I realize this, this may be somewhat already addressed. What questions, this is from Chadwick, what questions, if any, do you still have about the life of Neil Armstrong? Yeah. Unanswered questions. Whew. Yeah. Well, that is one of them. I mean, that clearly I'd like to know exactly what he took to the moon. You know, I asked him for the manifest you know, in, back in like 2003 or 2004. And he said, he told me, I'm going to have to look for it. And then I asked him one more time about it. And he said, I still haven't had time to look for it. And I knew I mean, from my experience with Neil at that point that you don't ask him the same thing three times in a row. But I asked him because I wanted to see it. And I did talk to him specifically about it. And, and his answer was not, it was ambiguous what the answer was. So that I want to know. And then there are some things about his growing up that I'm, I mean, again, child is the father to the man. There's certain things about his growing up and his relationship, especially with his father, you know, that, that I would be interested in. I mean, it's hard to be a biographer in this modern age and not have some interest in the psychology, psychological development of the, of the personality that you're dealing with. I guess I would like to, to, to have a, a deeper dive into Neil's psychology, but I don't know. There's no way to get that. I mean, I've, I, there's, even if you could get a hold of the NASA records where they did psychological profiling, you know, when he was becoming an astronaut, and I don't think those records even exist anymore. If, if they do, they've never been made available publicly in any way. But I would like to, I would, there are things about his growing up and his relationship with his father and, and that I would really be interested in knowing more about. So I think we have time, we'll give it five more minutes because I think there are so many questions. I want to apologize in advance if I haven't gotten to everyone's question, but I want to ask two more questions on behalf of the audience, if that's okay. Yeah, fine. So one of them, I think a great question here from one of our audience members that Buzz Aldrin had very public run-ins with the goofballs <laughs> who think that the Apollo landing was faked. What did Neil Armstrong think about the conspiracy theorists and was he ever accosted by them? If so, how did he handle it? Absolutely he was. And in fact, the same guy that Buzz punched, you know, out in Beverly Hills, you know, he, he came to Neil's, Neil was on different boards of directors of different companies. He came to at least one of Neil's board meetings and tried to get Neil to swear in a Bible that he had gone to the moon. He had the same guy, I'm not, I'm not ever saying the man's name out loud. I don't want to give him any publicity at all. 
but he also rented driveway space from one of Neil's neighbors in a van and it had a motion picture camera or video camera with, and was, and, and in fact, at one point, Neil and his wife backed out and were going down the road and this van pulled out behind them. And there was like a speed, there was like a car chase, you know, tracing Armstrong, you know, Neil wanted to get away from him. And I think somehow, I think there was a cell phone involved by that point. And Carol, the wife called the, the Indian Hill police and, and they got involved. But yeah, I mean, Buzz has gone through it, but I think Neil went through it even more so. Uh, you can go, if you want, really want to get into this kind of crazy stuff, if you go to YouTube, there are lots of videos where almost all the Apollo moon guys were accosted by one or another of these kooks. And it's almost always, you know, swearing on the Bible. And, you know, as if somehow... I mean, it was such an inappropriate thing to ask somebody to do, really. And Neil, one thing that Neil said, and you can see this if you see one of the YouTube videos, when this man came and said, we well, swear in the Bible that you've been to the moon. Neil said, knowing you, the Bible's probably fake, you know. So, so Neil threw it right back at him. So, no, he, he had to put up with this. I mean, if you, if you go to my, my books that Purdue published on Neil's letters, I have a whole chapter that's full of letters from conspiracy people and Neil's responses to them. It bothered him to no end that there could be people that, that would still be so ignorant of basic physics and things to think that, you know, that this was made up. I mean, one thing that he would always say is, look, we were in a almost life or death struggle with the Soviet Union to be first into the moon. And if the Soviets had any inclination whatsoever, any suspicion that we were faking it, they would have been all over it. But they, they weren't because they knew they knew from their own technology that that it was not only possible, but the Americans had done it. So and, and Neil also said, well, you know, to fake it, it would have been harder to fake it than it would be to actually do it. You know, and there's a lot of sense in that, too. So it, it was, you know, it, it was uh, tough for him to hear this for years and years and years. It just would never go away. It never will go away, I don't think. And maybe when we go back, when somebody from planet Earth goes back and, and maybe people will realize, yeah, it can be done. It has been done again and, and it'll, it'll stop. It's just, it was very hard for him to, to live with all of the conspiracy theories. Thank you once again, Dr. Hansen. I think, actually, I think we could continue this conversation, but I, I really want to just say, you know, once again, uh, thank you for joining us from Birmingham, Alabama Hi. this evening. I'm sorry, we didn't get to greet you in person. And of course you missed the snow that we had here in Ohio, but I, I do want to thank you. And again, I want to thank the audience for their questions. I apologize if we didn't get around to all of the questions this evening, but it's been, you know, certainly a, a different experience this year with the pandemic and having our uh, programming online through Zoom. We are looking forward in the fall to a return to face-to-face -face programming. So I do want to make, if, if I can, just a very quick announcement, uh, a heads up if you like, that on October the 21st at the Hamilton campus, the Michael J. Colligan History Project is looking forward to welcoming our next speaker, which will be the historian uh, Doris Cones Goodwin. So I will be releasing officially more information about that program in the months to come. I want to thank everyone uh, who attended tonight. We will be thanking you all for attending tonight's event. There will also be an opportunity to win signed copies of the First Man biography, which Dr. Hansen has very graciously agreed to sign for our audience. Uh, so there will be a, a little bit of a, a trivia quiz, uh, a little giveaway for the attendees of tonight's event. So once again, thank you to Dr. Hansen. Thank, thank you. you to our audience and uh, have a wonderful Earth Night. Earth, Earth Day evening, and I look forward to joining you for more public programming at uh, Miami University Regionals in the near future. Thank you once again.